Welcome to Ability Assistance. My name is Phyllis Jones, Chair of the North Andover Commission on Ability Assistance. My name is Stacy Liebowitz, and I'm the Secretary of the North Andover Commission on Ability Assistance. Our guest today is Valerie Fletcher, Executive Director for the Institute for Human-Centered Design. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. As are we. So we've got you here on behalf of both the Center for Institute, that's a, that's a mouthful. Institute for <laughs> Human Centered, Centered Design. Design. <laughs> and also you run the New England Ameri uh, ADA Center. We do, we do, and we've run that center since 1996. I get the emails from oh, those good. folks. <laughs> good. The best part of that email is usually the caricature. <laughs> I will, I will communicate that to the collector of the cartoons. <laughs> that, that, in fact, I was looking at the website this morning as I was collecting some information for the opening and the closing, and I think the one I saw in there was, it said, handicapped accessible, and you see somebody sitting in a wheelchair in front of a staircase where the sign actually says handicapped accessible. And I'm sitting there going, yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Not just limited to a cartoon experience. No, exactly. no but no, that's, so relevant. That, yeah. That's why I was so like, relevant. I'm, I'm, I'm giggling, but I'm giggling because, yep, I've seen that right. in real life. Right. Yes. Right. More times than we care, care to, to admit. Yes. We've seen it so many places. Yes, but caricatures aside, we usually always start these episodes with asking our guests, this is such a unique field to be in, working with people who work with people or on behalf of people who focus on those who are considered disabled, whether it be mm -hmm. obvious disabilities or as we like to call silent disabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What focused you into this industry? <laughs> Thank you, Phyllis. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've been very fortunate. Um, I've had a lot of a lot of satisfying experiences over the course of my career, um, but there was a pattern for a long time. Uh, so I have, um, I have a background in working on issues of public mental health and on non-discrimination across the spectrum of culture in particular, race okay. and culture. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have a background in design. And that is the thing that makes my blood run faster in many ways. Oh, <laughs> nice. But, it isn't enough. It doesn't satisfy my sense of needing to do something that makes a difference in the world. So it was too much like popsicles for Eskimos. So I would go back and forth between them. I was very fortunate to have a wonderful arc in public mental health where I actually had an increasing uh, opportunity for shaping systems and influence um, and always worked very closely with people with psychiatric disabilities. That was always a key part of, uh, of, of what mattered to me. So I created the Office on Consumer Affairs for the Department of Mental Health here in Massachusetts, okay. uh, ran the Alliance for the Mentally Ill for a period of time, um, and engaged people with disabilities in the redesign of the mental health system very aggressively. So it was a very big deal. But that has always, been, yeah, that has always that. been a core part of what matters to me. And Change of administration, change uh, in politics. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a state government. This is a gubernatorial appointment. You know, you you you, you figure out how to live with the changes, or you make a change yourself. Correct. Mm -hmm. And um, what was in front of me was being able to recreate sort of this participatory planning process in public agencies um, by being a consultant all by my lonesome around the country, which was not my idea of a good time. <laughs> And an old friend who was on the board of this organization, which was very small at the time in 1997, um, said, don't laugh at me. Um, there's something here that you need to pay attention to. And I did, and it was like the skies opened up. Just like, oh my God, it's marrying design to meaningful change. It was the oh, thing yeah. that really just It was seemed, like that lynch. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and where else? I'd never found that before. Mm -hmm. You know, so the thing that made my blood run faster also made a difference in people's lives and offered an abundant opportunity for that's learning. That's like a once in a lifetime yeah. type of opportunity. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I've been doing. Especially with the skill set, <laughs> yes. Yes, I count myself. I've never looked back, not for a minute. Every day is different. And so I, I my uh, old friend, a, a pediatrician specializing 
in children with Down syndrome in particular, professor at the Harvard Medical School, was the chairman of our board when I was hired. And Alan's favorite expression was, I'm just a lucky duck. I am <laughs> just a lucky duck. Um, you know, so I've had the privilege of doing this work for all of these years. And we're still small. We're about 33 people mm -hmm. scattered around the country. But our work is global. So this conversation is not just in the United States, mm -hmm. um, but across the world. And I think that's an important part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Disability or difference in ability is a pervasive, ordinary human phenomenon. Right, and, and it doesn't matter if you're born with it. No. Mm -hmm. Or acquire it. As or acquire you, it. Which will happen to so many through the lifespan. And, and I think, yeah, it's, it's basically a universal human yeah. experience unless you're unlucky enough to die young. Right, right. <laughs> In and which case it could be because of. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. of the lack of. And yeah. I guess with that, this, all of this, this journey has brought you to the Institute for Human-Centered Design, and you talk about that this is yeah. kind of an international-based yeah. um, organization. Tell us um, how this organization came to be and the inner workings and what sure. you, you know, work on and accomplish with this organization. It was originally about this idea of the role in design in equity for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. It's evolved over time to look also at the, of course, the very real phenomenon of where aging intersects with disability. So it was ability, aging, it was, think about, we were born in 1978, which was the year that there were regulations finally available You're for Section 504. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, the, the concept. No, 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 I understand. The organization is <laughs> yeah. younger. Oh, the organization is younger. It's younger than, than me, yes. too. So. Uh, yeah. Um, so. But it was a state project. Originally, it was a state project. So that 504 intersected that year with deinstitutionalization for kids and adults. Yeah. Okay. All of a That's sudden, right. the idea that you farmed out people who were very different in mm -hmm. ability to institutions run by the Commonwealth for the most part or by states all over the country was ending. Basically, this is now perceived as a bad idea that it was expensive, it was dehumanizing, mm -hmm. yep. it prevented people from living the lives that they chose. So think about a role of design if you're going to make that work. So it was partly about we've got tools to think about design that includes everybody, but we've also got a massive challenge of thinking about how to make our cities and towns work for people who haven't been there before. Right. So the earliest days, they were in a big barn-like structure in Boston uh, over, it, it was actually all part of Mass College of Art in the Longwood area. Yes. And um, I'm old enough to know that there was an appetite for happenings at that time. It was sort of learn by doing. Mm -hmm. So they had piles of cardboard and piles of wood and they helped people figure out how to change the world so that people could participate. And it involved both kids and adults. And so a lot of that was really thinking of, the original name was adaptive environments. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. And it was really thinking about what does it mean for a school? What does it mean for home? Right. What does it mean for the town library? What does it mean for getting around? Yeah. You know, public transportation was an early interest. That's where it started. So it was really more focused on the education and the, the active part of finding solutions via something we call design. Over time, it has evolved to be about baseline accessibility. We have, we're fortunate in the United States to have a baseline that basically says, this is the non-negotiable yes, um, right. based on federal standards and state codes long before the ADA, mm -hmm. so that the federal standards only applied if you got federal money. State code was coming along, and that was a very important part of this, too. And one, what a lot of people don't necessarily realize when you say the baseline is you can't go below what the federal government right. says. The state can always grant more. Mm -hmm. They can grant a variance. Right. Yes. If it and is it has justified. to be, and it has to also be more. Now the other variance is is then also if you've got a building that's 125 right. years old, then they can also grant the variance of. You, you you also you're expected to negotiate between the shared values of accessibility and historic preservation. Yes. Right. right. 
right. and it's something to that find we do that a balance. Lot of. Right. So over the course of time, um, we have continued to be about design, but increasingly recognized that accessibility and the experience of accessibility was teaching us that you know if it if it's compliant, if it's yes. accessible, it works better for everybody. Of course. I mean, it, it, it's impossible for young people to imagine a world without curb cuts. Impossible for yeah. young people to yeah. imagine suitcases that had handles and right, no wheels. Right, right. Because curb cuts actually made that possible. Right. Bicycles, yeah. baby Audi strollers. Audio yes. books. Audio, audio all, books. Yes. Yeah. I mean, things that started that way. I mean, people who are deaf were the first ones to adopt texting. Mm -hmm. And there was a separate little thing that you used for texting. But they were the pioneers on that. Yeah. And it, it took off like an explosion. Mm -hmm. And now, now everybody does it. We exactly. all do it. We they do it more than being on the phone. We'd so. be lost without it. Yeah. But those were the kinds of things that made people say, hey, wait a minute. You know, if it works for people at the edges, it turns out to work better for everybody. everybody. Yeah. So then the idea of what we were calling back then universal design came into focus. So I'm, I'm pleased to say that our organization was one of the conduits of that mm -hmm. idea. So I published the first book in 1995 called Strategies for Teaching Universal Design. Okay. Tell and us about that. Yeah. That, was, that was a fortunate opportunity to work with a Japanese company that made a big commitment to provide a little seed funding in 22 colleges and universities, hmm. in design schools, to give people a chance to try this out. What would a studio or a course look like that introduced these ideas? And how did you get people to participate right. to make sense of this idea? Because if it wasn't involving people with lived experience, it was just a how concept. How would they know? Yeah. Just a concept. Yeah. So that was, um, that was in 1995. By 1997, our organization and my predecessor were meeting with a small group of people, all US folks, and quite small organizations, but also the University of North Carolina, the State University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, State University of New York at Buffalo, uh, and a couple of other individuals, to basically come up with the principles of mm -hmm. universal design. And that was in 97. By fall of 97, I was in discussion with them as they were seeking to hire only, you know, the, the replacement for founder. Um, and so it was very early on, and we had made a commitment to um, <coughs> play a key role in hosting the first international conference oh, on universal yeah. design. Because while the U.S. was kind of inventing this, so were a lot of other countries. Right. So why not come together? Needed to come together. And share together. ideas. Absolutely. So, yeah. And for some, the biggest motivation was the aging of the population. And it's probably growing sense. even more so because... Yeah. I mean, at least in this country, I can't speak to other populations in other countries, mm -hmm. but the baby boomers. Yep. Yes. Post-World War II baby boomers. Yep. And, and the Gen birth X rate. is not too far behind. And, and, and the birth <laughs> rate. But our population but isn't as large. As, as large, right. but still. It's and the birth rate is dropping. Yes. yes. So you have fewer people to care for right. older people. Right. Right. So design steps in as a way to reduce the limitations of aging. Mm -hmm and enhance the quality of life the quality yeah. of life and independence and to facilitate our ability to be fully yeah. engaged in yeah. the community and in our own choices so that was a thrilling moment to arrive yeah so we were hosting that conference in, in concert with a number of organ other organizations and with the united nations who was also waking up to the role of design ah. and we did that in new york in 98 we did the second one two years later in Providence with RISD. We did the third one in partnership with our Japanese colleagues who were creating a new organization. We did that in Yokohama. Oh, wow. And that was extraordinary because in a culture that felt they had a shared stake in an aging population and figuring out how to make it work, thousands of people came to the exhibit portion of the conference. Thousands, like kids, school groups. Oh, it wow. was extraordinary. Two years later, we did Rio de Janeiro, and that was, we ran that primarily. That was an effort to really look at a part of the world where aging wasn't the dominant issue, right. but there was a, an astonishing level of creativity around disability. 
and there were a few really important leaders, but it was bringing this into a very different part of the world mm -hmm. to say, you know, how can we play together? Right. Um, the following, two, two years later, we joined the Japanese again in Kyoto. And then I looked up and said, oh my god, I, I don't think we want to be a convener every two years. It's going to kill us. <laughs> um, and we can't do another thing because yeah. it's so difficult to do that. Um, and what we made a decision to do was to invest our energies and abilities in practice. Okay. So we became consultants in design and consultants in the practice of both accessibility and inclusive design. Yeah. And we have done that since an increasing volume with every passing year mm -hmm. and provide the deep expertise in how to do it. And we've been very fortunate to be able to do that in a whole variety of sectors. We are blessed not to actually have to worry about how we're going to make our budget because we make our budget by providing service. Mm -hmm. we, we earn our budget every year. Yeah. And we do that in many sectors. We work in public transit. We do very extensive work in culture. We do very extensive work in higher ed. Mm -hmm. We do a little bit of work in healthcare. Now, um, I understand you cannot name who you've done these clients right, for. Right. However, if you could have, are these organizations ones that we would recognize? You would indeed. Okay. Um, and, and I have to say, uh, to the credit of the organizations that we've worked with, um, they've come knocking on the door. We do no marketing. So it's, it's kind of word of mouth and getting a sense of we want somebody who um, has the experience to be mm -hmm. able to help us do this practical thing, who can also help us to think differently. And it shows the need. It, it does clearly show the shows the need yes. when they're knocking it on your door. And I mean, I know, again, like Phyllis said, you can't name names, but can you provide an example of a type of situation where you've been able to provide your service and the benefit that it is? Actually, let made. me use one that is next door. Okay. <laughs> the town of Andover. Really? The town of Andover has been a marvelous client. We okay. did an ADA transition plan for them, but we also had the opportunity to work with them on a project that is so terrific and is now coming to fruition. And that is making a truly inclusive rail trail into a place that I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but that's and that's and marvelous. as a testament to our continuing commitment around the only way you know what's going to work is to bring people in to the real environment yeah. and listen to what they experience. So I am happy to say with the good support of the town of Andover, we were actually able to bring a crowd of people was together. It, I'm, I'm sorry, was it North Andover or Andover? Andover. Okay. So this is your neighbor. Okay. Um, but we had user experts from 9 to 90. Wow. One morning walking the trail. Where is that rail trail located? It is next to the reservoir, but I don't remember the exact okay. name okay. of it. Is but it it's paved? A, it's about to be, it's about to be done. Okay. It, this okay. is this was the planning process, mm -hmm. and the town deserves enormous credit for the commitment they made for the town, but also for going beyond it and really thinking about what an opportunity this represents. Because I've, as you know, I yeah. I won't name the name, but I do walk every year in a sixty-mile oh, wow. walk right. for a charity, uh -huh, uh -huh. and one of the things I do is part of my walking is as I train on these paved rail trails mm -hmm. and a lot of times I have to go to the North Shore to go to them so I find them extremely safe yeah, yeah. accessible accessible mm -hmm. and and useful and kind of just long enough yeah <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly. although I, I I've heard rumors that because the, the trains actually intersected yeah. that they're looking at over the course of a period of time, maybe trying to connect them mm -hmm. somehow so that theoretically, you know, if the rail, let's say, connected from Andover to Peabody, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to walk that as a train. Well, I probably <laughs> should. I would just wouldn't want to do it alone. Um, you know, that you could walk that rail you're right, trail, you're right. yeah. you know, and the markers would and, be up. And, and, you know, among the other clients that we have, and, uh, and I'm very proud of working with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, 
because we're so blessed in Massachusetts that it's 10% of the land mass here. Yeah. It's a public yes, agency, yeah, right. public parks, um, which is just a... For such a small I, state, and it's such it's comparatively wonderful. speaking. Such yeah. an it's asset. Wonderful. And, and uh, the current commissioner was in Revere and had responsibilities for that very popular public beach. So there's a sense of this is the yeah. people's park. Uh, so that's been thrilling. So we, we've worked with municipalities all over the state and around the country, but we've also worked with public agencies. And DCR, you know, has a, 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 they have a marvelous program for people with disabilities called the Universal Access Program. We've been working not on that, but on making sure that all of the parks work for everyone. Yes. Um, and, you know, since COVID, people have found our state parks in droves mm -hmm. more That's than true. they ever have yes. before. And part of what I think we all need to be looking at in, in our shared recreation places, whether that's entertainment places, sports places, mm -hmm. outdoor recreation, we have to be thinking about the changing profile. Right. We need to be thinking about what does it mean when the majority of people with disabilities in the six New England states have a brain-based reason for disability. Mm -hmm. What does it mean when people on the spectrum or people with neurodiversity broader than just the spectrum of autism derive tremendous benefit from being out of doors? Mm -hmm. yes. And how do you make those places friendlier, more receptive, more mm -hmm. manageable for that spectrum? And older people have gone in droves. Yeah. Now let me ask you, towns, state agencies, large corporations. We're talking places with larger budgets, okay? What about, you know, maybe not a mom and pop store type mm -hmm. of a situation, but a smaller, reasonably sized, you know, maybe a law firm of maybe 30 people, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. or a smaller company, you know, that mm -hmm. does manufacturing of some sort, roughly 30 people. Mm -hmm. They're not huge, but they're smaller, they're mm -hmm. more local. Mm -hmm. You know, is that some place, you know, if, I, if we've got a small company working, you know, that's based here in town and they're like, this sounds great, mm -hmm. but I don't have $30 million to be able right. to spend. Is right. that, right. Is that so some place you can work with? I think one of the things that we all need to understand is work is a particularly important part of what makes life work for each of us. Yes. Right. And I was just, I'm sure you uh, news junkies like yourself probably <laughs> saw it. We've got 220,000 open jobs in Massachusetts. Yes. yes. Right now. There's 60,000 in Connecticut. This is a crisis. Um, we don't know where all those people are, but they're not in those jobs. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that we're doing with employers of all kinds is working with them to recognize that your obligations for compliance is for people who self-report having a disability and needing accommodation. Correct. Yes. yes. The majority of people with disabilities do not disclose their disability. They're afraid, They're afraid to. to. They're, They're afraid, afraid to, to, and they choose not to, particularly mm -hmm. in a world in which non-apparent reasons for disability are the norm. Yeah. Yes. So even if you had an IEP in high school, an uh, individual education plan, yeah. you go off to college and you've abandoned that. Yes. So yes. Nobody's going to know. I don't need it anymore yeah. and I'm not going to do it. We're finding that more and more employers recognize that keeping people, good people, is what they need to do. Yes. yes. How do we figure this out? Yeah. How do we become the place that somebody wants to come and then wants to stay? And that's true whether you're a f seven person firm or a you know, 10,000 person firm. Because right. it's, mm -hmm. it's very expensive to hire. It's very expensive to reach and hire, that train, and, you and re uh, you yeah. know. So and then people want to know, and one insane. of the things they want to know is how do we create a whole environment, both mm -hmm. with the physical environment and with the technology, so that it is seamless for people across a broad spectrum of bodies and brains, so that you don't have to have a special accommodation, but that there's the ability to make it work. Among the things we're finding is certainly needs to, equity and flexibility are the two principal concerns. And what we find in our research, in our continuous work in this area, in order for people to feel good about a workplace, there has to be some sense of control. 
Okay, exactly. so you mentioned the number of jobs we have mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. A lot of those jobs are not desk jobs. True, right. true. Uh, probably the yep. greater majority are retail yes. jobs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and then you have a lot of people who want to work but are afraid to or can't because they need an accommodation of some sort. Mm -hmm. And now you have the local donut shop. We won't mention any actual any names, names right. but you've got a local donut shop that desperately needs people, mm -hmm. and they're hiring at fifteen, sixteen dollars an hour, mm -hmm. you know, or, mm -hmm. or shortly over minimum wage. And you've got the person who'd like to work, but they can't handle that fast-paced, busy environment. How do, how do we marry the two so that we fill that job, yeah, yeah. we give that person some self-fulfillment self right. Right, right. and make that happen? I, I think that it's time, given the radical shift of work since COVID, whether you're an essential worker or whether you're you know, privileged to be in, a, in an environment of you know, more of the knowledge worker, People are best at their jobs when the job fits what they do best right. yes. and what right. they're interested in. And that is available in the donut shop, in the legal office, in the giant corporation, in the laboratories. Being able to really think about that and to recognize this is, the, this is a big challenge and, and people are beginning to get there. I mean, the giant corporations that have so many more resources right. than the small right. companies. Right get there sooner, to recognize that they have seen an advantage in the diversity of workers. That people think differently, they solve problems better because it's not an echo chamber of people talking to each other right. who are all of the same mind. Right. We need that and I yes. think people are beginning to recognize that that has real value. Mm -hmm. And if that means you have to shift how you do something, the cost benefit analysis is probably pretty good. But we have to tell those stories right. about how it isn't going to kill you and it is going to allow a quality of performance and satisfaction, mm -hmm. which is really the heart of successful work. They're going to be your best workers, really, when yes. you're providing that support. I think obviously matching the person with the right job, yeah, yeah. but then what are those accommodations that need to happen? Yeah. And you're going to retain, because I think to the point of training and all of those mm -hmm. things with onboarding mm -hmm. and the turnaround, how do we retain that talent? And if you're making that investment, yeah. you know, whatever that design element may be with lighting or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever it is, you're going to have retention. And, and it is often, I'm so glad you brought that up, because sometimes it's not... This is very different from accessibility where we think, oh my God, it's going to cost me so much more real estate. Where am I going to get that real estate? In many cases, it's not real estate at all. Um, first of all, mobility remains the national number one reason for disability, but it's not wheelchair users. That's a very important population. And all the standards are based on that population and the anthropometrics, which are pretty easy to measure. 10 times more people have trouble walking who are counted as having a mobility disability. Yes. That's yeah. the crowd of people we all know with bad backs, bad hips, bad, bad knees, knees. <laughs> bad feet, ankles, yeah. you know. It, ankles. Yeah. It, all of yeah. that is so much more pervasive. Yeah. And often, it's are there places to sit that allow yeah. me to navigate the world? That's yeah. not to a take budget a break. buster. <laughs> to take a break. You know, that's, and it's not. You know, those are the kinds of things that matter. And I think we're also looking at technology, you know, and really thinking about how does that level the playing field if you do it right? And, and I think it's getting beyond the fear of. The, the, I think we could have this conversation off the books for yeah, for a few hours. For a few hours, but we're getting the signal yes. that well, time to wrap time it up. Is running down, and this is I feel like this this time has gone by so quickly, and yes. we would love to have you back well, on I, again. Well, I have to say I, I applaud your commitment. Um, oh, thank and you. I applaud your team uh, <laughs> who makes this so easy. Um, I, but this is this is really important work, and yeah. I think thank bringing you. it to thank you. the local level. Um, where it's really about 
I mean, where we live our lives, which is yeah. in community. I mean, that's exactly. why we keep doing municipal work because it, that's where the rubber meets the yeah, road. Exactly. That's uh, so you know, important. I was a poli sci major, and you know, Tip O'Neill's old saying, you know, <laughs> all politics is it's local. local. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, absolutely. And yeah. I and I think you know, thinking about just this is where we experience community. We're we're all struggling with mm -hmm. isolation and loneliness. Especially post-COVID. Yes. Especially post-COVID and the chance to be in communities that welcome Exactly. Everyone. is about as good as it gets. And so that's, that's what we that's try. To you. That's Ability great, assistance, yeah, yeah. not that's disability. That's a great note to end on. So thank yes. you again so You're much for welcome. being here. Thank you. Welcome. You can reach the Institute for Human-Centered Design at www.humancenteredesign.org. If you have any questions regarding the Americans Disabilities Act or ADA, you can reach the New England ADA Center at newenglandada.org. And we want to thank our crew this month, NECC student Cassie Buonanno, uh, GLTS alum John Cafori, and from the North and North Shore, sorry, Academy, uh, Zachary Jones, and from Curry College, Carly Jones. We're still out with details. We're still working out details with Senator Bruce Tarr's office, who hopes to join us in February. We're going to start calling it his annual yeah. Beacon Hill update. update yeah. Yes. In March, Waystone will be back to finish their conversation with us to talk about employment programs that they have. State Representative Adrian Ramos will be joining us uh, in May. And finally, what is currently known as Mass Rehab Commission will be hopefully known as Mass Ability by then. And they'll be our June guests rounding out our 2023-2024 season. That. We're already looking forward to the next yes, season. Yes, <laughs> I know. Looking forward to 2024-2025. And we spoke about when the 50th episode is going to be. This is exciting. I, I wonder, well, do the big folks do this? talking so far in advance? I think so. I think this is a great thing. I don't know. <laughs> We're very we, excited. We are consistently looking for new topics to explore here on Ability Assistance. We would truly love to know what topics you want yes. more information about. If there are specific topics you want to learn more about, please email me directly at pjones, that's P-J-O-N-E-S, at northandovermagovernor.gov, or you can call me directly. Yes, it goes straight she, to my yes. cell phone. Or she might actually pick up. Yes, at 978-494-0136. In addition to watching through your cable station, you can catch all of our programs on demand via YouTube, the Cablecast app through Roku, Roku Apple TV, the Apple App Store, and the Android system, North Andover Cam's website. We've got the North Andover website, mm -hmm. and we roll everything out via podcast on Podbean. Any more areas that we can get those out? <laughs> We're trying. Thank you very much, and stay warm.